So welcome. We are going to be beginning a journey through the biblical book of Philippians next week. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, letter, a wonderful epistle. Uh, that, that journey is going to take us right to Easter Sunday, if you can believe that. Easter Sunday, that'll be in the beginning of April. I'm really hoping we can celebrate Easter Sunday up on the hill. Um, so we can be praying towards that. So unlike a lot of Paul's other, um, and, and, and Peter and John, a lot, unlike a lot of the other epistles, um, a lot of the other epistles are written in part to encourage the church, but in part because there, there were problems and issues going on in the churches. And with Philippians, you don't get much of that at all. Philippians is really uh, largely a letter of Paul's appreciation to the church um, that he writes. I have an old study Bible, and, and it comments, it says uh, about the characteristics of the church, it says, Philippians is a spiritual love letter to the church, filled with warm affection and gratitude, written under hard circumstances. While Paul was a prisoner, it emphasizes victory and joy. And I just love that, that idea of Philippians being a spiritual love letter to the church. A spiritual love letter. So I'm kind of thinking of that, this series um, in that framework, this spiritual love letter. I think we can still receive it as such. Um, before we get into the letter itself, this morning we're going to take a, a quick look at where the story began. Um, Philippians is a letter that was written to a church by the Apostle Paul, most likely while he was imprisoned in Rome. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a church that would have been young at the time. It was established by Paul and his companions. It was a missionary team on what we know of as Paul's second miss, missionary journey. That was his second of three major missionary journeys through um, kind of the known world at the time within the Roman Empire. Uh, this letter is written to a church in a city in modern day Greece. Um, it was a Greek city of Philippi, uh, but again, it would have been under the Roman Empire at that time in a region known as Eastern Macedonia. Um, it's a Gentile city. Uh, that doesn't mean that there weren't Jews in the city, um, but it's, it's a predominantly Gentile city. There would have been many religious beliefs in the city, but they would have been yet to have been introduced um, to Jesus uh, as we get into Acts 16 this morning, and that's what we're going to look at. They, they weren't introduced to this idea of Jesus being a savior, one that can rescue us from our sins and reconcile us to the living God. So let me ask real quick, so why, so here now Paul, as we get into Acts 16, Paul will be entering a city with a lot of different beliefs and a lot of different customs. Why would his message be received any differently? Why would it have any more influence than any other message out there? That's a question for you. Why? I mean, we live in a country today, we live in a world today where there's still plenty of beliefs, plenty of ideas, plenty of religions. Why would the Christian message of Jesus Christ have any more influence than any other message? Isn't that still a question for us? Why? Power. Okay, power? Change, power, change. They never seen power like Yep. It's, it's the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's How about because it's true, right? It's, it's the true message of God's salvation. The one true God of the Bible. And it is empowered by his Holy Spirit to convict of sin and convict the fact that it's truth, that we need to respond to it. Now, not every heart responds to it, obviously. And even the people that Paul went to, not every heart responded to it. 
But w what we have seen through the last 2,000 years has been a remarkable response throughout the world because God has turned hearts to himself. Because it is his salvation empowered by the Holy Spirit of the one true God of the universe. So we're going to take a real quick bird's eye view of, of Acts 16. We'll, we'll start at verse 9 and go through the end of the chapter. And like I said, it's going to be, it's going to be the 3,000 um, the 3,000 foot view here. Um, and, and what's cool is we're going to witness, I think, God's miraculous and we could even say mysterious work the way he begins building this church. And I'm hopeful that it encourages us that God is still building his church in such a way, in a way that's miraculous and mysterious. Um, we'll start here by reading verses 9 and 10 of Acts 16. This kind of breaks into the middle of a paragraph. It says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia. So that's this region that we've been talking about. Um, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding, and I just want to note that word concluding um, in the original language is kind of a stronger word, this idea that they concluded together. It was something that they talked about, discussed, and then decided together, concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So we can notice right off the bat here, we can notice how Paul and his companions respond to God's leading. Now, just prior to this, to be fair, we didn't read a couple verses. It's interesting. The, the Holy Spirit had, in some unexplained matter, we're not given all the details, basically put up a stop sign for Paul and his companions on this second missionary journey. They had plans to go into Asia, and for at least for this time, God said, not now. And we don't know exactly what factors played into that, but we know that God didn't allow them to go. So now, um, Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia pleading for help. And so he and his companions receive this as a message from the Lord calling them to go into that region and preach the gospel. So let, let's note a couple of things here. For one, the vision, think about the vision. It's, very, it's really pretty simple. There's a man that Paul knows somehow it, that he's from this region of Macedonia, and he's pleading for help. So, so what is that? It, it, at, at very basic value, let me just ask one more question to you guys. What, what does that tell you? Is there any, any insight you get from that simple vision of Paul? Right, right. Like, likely no one there at that time. Okay. Does, does it strike you that this, that this man is just pleading for help? So sometimes I think, I think we think of the Christian faith... As if, again, like I said, it's just, it's just a different religious system to offer within, you know, kind of a gamut of other religious systems. Or, 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 or maybe we think of it as, as, you know, something that I need to argue my belief being superior to someone else's belief. But, but the gospel, again, the good news of Jesus is really about bringing mankind, this is a human being, a man from Macedonia, pleading for help. It's about bringing mankind the help that they most need. Right? It's about bringing people the help that they most need, that they actually can be salvation in the sense of having sins forgiven and being reconciled to the living God. And then there is a new way of living, right? We don't just make converts. We look to make disciples, that we have people discipled and led in God's word by the power of his Holy Spirit. There's a new way to live. That, that, that is actually the help that people need most. 
Now, that gospel also means, and we see this as churches are formed, that also means entering into people's felt needs, into their physical needs. It means, it means thinking of the whole person, of a person holistically, what are the needs of that person. But in the end, that's all done in Jesus' love, in Jesus' name. The Jesus who knows the thing we need most is to be reconciled to the living God. Secondly, I, I think that we should see that Paul is willing to adjust his plans to the Lord's leading. Uh, 2020 was a, a year of huge, a huge adjustment. This continues to be a season of adjustment for us. Um, when God told him no, and God did that. God did that, like I said, just prior to these verses. When God told him no, he, he didn't force the issue. He's like, okay, that was my plan. That's where I thought I was going. But maybe not. And then when God told him go... He went. So, so you, you get this sense that Paul and his companions have this incredible ability to adjust to what God is calling them to. And sometimes that was different than what they originally thought when they got going. That, that, take, that takes an intimate walk with the Lord. That takes a, a keen listening to the God's Holy Spirit. And that takes a willingness to be flexible for those of us who have a hard time being flexible. Um, it also takes humble discernment concerning what God is saying. You know, I, I feel that God, if I feel that God is leading me to do something, uh, to say something, to go somewhere, to pursue something, there's some discernment involved there. I, I must be willing to weigh it against what I know of God in Christ. I also, even as a spirit, Holy Spirit indwelled believer, I also need to recognize that I have limitations in this, in this broken body, in this broken world. So, so this is many, one of the many reasons that we have God's perfect word. One of the many reasons that we have God's community. I, I love that, that even Paul seemed to discuss the meaning of this vision with his companions before they pressed on. That's, that's the sense that we get in verse 10, that, that, that there, there's a decision made by the entire group. So I can say that if I feel like God's calling me to do something, to say something, to, to be about something, to go somewhere, it's probably wise to, to bring some other mature believers into that discussion. And not just like we want to tend to go talk to people that just will tell us what we want to hear, right? But maybe it's, it's good to say, hey, maybe I need to have some discussions and, and weigh this, this idea, this concept, what the Lord is burdening my heart with, with, with a variety of other mature believers. I, I also think, and this should be obvious, but it's not always, I also have to say, okay, what I think the Lord is showing me, leading me to, I have to, I have to be really honest to see if what I feel God has spoken to me is counter to a few things. Is it counter to the, to the character and teaching of Jesus Christ? Well, if it is, then I'm like, I'm the wrong one here, right? That, that, we, that should be obvious, but it's not always. If it's counter to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, if it's counter to these things, then I say, well, wait a minute. Maybe what I think I heard, I didn't hear, or I didn't hear right. If it's counter to love and humility, if it's counter to promoting unity within the church, if it's counter to the gospel of Jesus Christ being preeminent above all other agendas, if it's counter to any of those things, I need to step back and maybe reevaluate and not be afraid to do that and reevaluate what I think I heard. But as I, as I, as I, uh, as I run this by other mature believers that won't just give me kind of a confirmation bias, but really wrestle through that, and there's an affirmation, and, and it's in harmony with God's word, and it's in harmony with the character and the teaching of Christ. It's in harmony with the fruit of the Spirit. It promotes harmony within the church, and it keeps the gospel as preeminent. Then I say, wow, you know, I, I can feel confident to move forward. Because the Spirit of the living God is still speaking. And He's still today, as He was in that day, it's still the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's still speaking and moving and guiding His people. 
verses 11 through 15. I, I hope you enjoy this story. I know there's a couple sections that might get a little long, but it, it's, a, it's a powerful story. Verses 11 through 15. Um, from Traos, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Sam Othrace. Anybody want to argue that pronunciation? <laughs> Feel free. And the next day, on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia. Now realize, again, this is one. This is one of several, but this is God at work. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message when she, realized, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. The word really there is that she was pretty exceedingly persuasive. Um, so Paul and his companions, this is Silas, this is Luke. Luke is the one who's writing, go to her home. I read one author that said, when you open your heart to the Lord, you also open your home as well. So consider how, how God begins this church. He begins this church, okay? So this is the beginnings of the church in Philippi. He begins this church with a conversation with a businesswoman. That's how he starts it. He starts it with a conversation with a businesswoman. Some biblical scholars feel like there was no, probably no, bib, uh, no um, Jewish synagogue in this city. And that may have been that, that there was no quorum, that they needed to have this quorum of ten men to establish a synagogue in the city. So some, some scholars believe there must not have been that quorum. So Paul seems uh, that he assumes correctly that there's probably still a place of prayer that, that people who fear the, the God of the Bible, the Jewish God, would be gathering and worshiping in prayer. So he goes and he finds this place of prayer and there's a group of women assembled there. And, and this, maybe shockingly for its time, this is no issue for Paul. Because for in Christ, God is breaking down all social barriers. So, so he has this conversation with, this, with these women, and Paul shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this woman, Lydia, this businesswoman, probably pretty well-to-do, she, she has a house. A lot of people think that the church in Philippi actually met in her house. She receives the message. So here, let me just say this. As Christians, we need to be a people about intentional and meaningful conversations. Now, I don't mean that that means like every time you walk up to someone, you're like, whoa, you know, people like that scare you a little bit. Whoa, they dig real deep right away. And they're like, you know, it, it, it's not bad to talk about the weather. It's not bad to talk about, you know, your daughter's school program or the ball game last night. And, and sometimes like that's actually a necessary part of living and conversing and sharing life together. But let me say this. If, if, if that, if that, if your conversation never rises above, hey, how about the weather today? Hey, hey, how about them eagles? If it never rises above that, I think you need to take a hard look. I think, I think you need to say, am I challenging myself to grow, to grow spiritually, to grow intellectually in Christ? And am I seeing my relational encounters as opportunities to offer God's grace to others? As Peter would say, in its various forms. This, of course, this takes discernment. Um, it takes listening to the Holy Spirit. It takes, you know, we're not, I'm not encouraging you to force the gospel on anyone, even for Paul. Like we already talked about, the Spirit at times said, hey, no, or pause. There's going to be times that God's going to say, don't say, don't go. And there's going to be times that when I'm listening to him and I'm just like, I, I know it in my heart. Say, Go. It may be after months of, of building a friendship with, with a neighbor. 
It, it may be, you know, just that first time you met this elderly widower and you're working in their home or what, what have you. It could be, you know, visiting your Uncle Charlie for, for Christmas. I don't know. But we have to be a people about meaningful conversation. We, we have to see where, where God is giving us opportunities to enter in to, to re things that really matter, right? Because Jesus is what mankind needs most. That's what we believe as Christians. He's, it, it's, it's only the help that Jesus brings that is going to deliver them forever. And, and our lives should be a testimony of that. So I, I have, um, there's a woman named Adele who recently passed away that I knew since I was real little from New Jersey. And, and I, uh, she's actually a relative of, of someone, she's actually Jeanette Frazier's mom. So she just passed away um, a few days ago. And one of the testimonies that I, just real simple testimony I saw online for her was from my Uncle Mike. And my Uncle Mike has been incredibly influential in my life and my faith. And, and he simply wrote, um, this was, he wrote to one of her sons online. He said, my very first Bible study was with your mom and Dick. And then he, he talks about how that happened. He said, I walked into their home to clean their carpets and asked about their, the, them wearing wooden crosses and the fact that they study the Bible together. He says, that was the beginning of a wonderful and blessed relationship with them and your whole family. So, so it just strikes me that as he says, why are you wearing those crosses? Why, why, does, why is the Bible on your kitchen table? Adele and, and her husband Dick at the time, he went to be with the Lord years ago, were willing to engage that conversation. And you know, hey, wait, hey man, we have a Bible study at our home. You should join. Are you afraid to do that? Because for my Uncle Mike, that, the, those were the seedlings of his faith, those conversations. That those were the people that were willing to, to draw him in and invite him to Jesus Christ. And that changed his life, not just for a year, not for, just for 10 years, for eternity. And then in turn, had a great influence on my life. And you don't have to be the Apostle Paul, and you don't have to be a pastor, and you don't have to be a missionary. I love that even, even for Paul, we see that it's not his powerful words that convinced Lydia. It, the Bible says that it was the Lord who opened her heart to Paul's message. Paul was just willing to open his mouth and share. And the Lord opened her heart. It's the same today. So, so the last section of these verses, and again, I'm going to read through it. Um, but it's just a wonderful story. Once, um, when we were going to the place of prayer, so this is still in Philippi, in the region, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit which she predicted the, by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. <laughs> like, that's weird. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girls, girl realized that their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and, that, and said, these men are Jews, right? So you get this sense of anti-Semitism. That's been something people, you know, there's been people against God's people of the Old Testament for all this history. These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating custom, customs unlawful, now you get this nationalistic pride, for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in their attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully 
Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. So not fun. About midnight, Paul and Silas were... What? Praying and singing hymns to God. Well, that's because Paul was an apostle. Listen, Paul was a man like you and me. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he, threw, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. He probably thought that that would be a better death than what Rome would hand to him. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his family were baptized. Isn't that amazing? The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens. They threw us into prison, and now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and, then, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escort them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met the brothers and, and encouraged them. Then they left. And some feel like Paul made that uh, appeal so that it would lessen some of the pressure on this early new baby church. So, so Paul and his companions encounter a slave girl. And I think in this, you know, I have to move through this quickly. <laughs> I think in this, we see that this, you know, this saying is true that God works in mysterious ways. They encounter, they encounter this slave girl, and, and this, this slave girl is um, possessed by an evil spirit. So in a sense, she's in double bondage. This is still true of some people today. She's in bondage by the Spirit, and she's in bondage by men who are, who are exploiting her for profit. And we, as we see in the Gospels uh, many times as, as demons encounter Jesus, they seem to feel compelled at times to pronounce at least the truth, in part, the truth of who they're encountering. Right? Jesus would encounter people that were uh, demonized, and they'd say, you're the Son of God! And, and it's, oh, it's hard sometimes to figure out why that happened. It seems like, assuredly, at some level, they have evil intent. But Paul's used to deliver this girl eventually. Um, some, some biblical scholars feel that the fact that this story is sandwiched between Lydia and the jailer, we're actually supposed to infer that possibly this girl came to Christ as well and became part of the nucleus of this new church. Um, but that leads them to a new set of troubles. They're... They're accused by these men who are mad that their prophet has been taken away of stirring up trouble. They're, they're stripped, they're humiliated, they're, they're beaten severely, they're flogged, they're, they're imprisoned, they're imprisoned in shackles in the stocks. But God is still at work. God's still working. God, in fact, is still implementing, even there, his plan of salvation. God, in fact, even there, is still building his church. Soon this infant church that includes 
businesswoman Lydia and possibly slave girl delivered from demons, uh, you know, is now about to include this, this jailer that was probably a, a retired Roman soldier. A lot, of, a lot of retired Roman soldiers would take up such positions. And, and, and Paul and Silas, you think about it, at this moment, Paul and Silas could be deeply questioning their circumstances. They're like, God, we obeyed you. You said, don't go here, go here. And we went, and now this is what we get? We, we get beaten, we get flogged, and we get thrown in jail? You ever feel that way? God, I obeyed you, and this is what I get? But that's not what they're doing. At least in part, that's not what they're doing, because they where we often miss this, they expected that suffering with Christ comes with, li for, with living for him. They expected that that was part of the deal. That, that if I'm going to live for Jesus, I'm going to suffer for Jesus. That was like, yep. So, so here they are. So they're, 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 they're not griping and they're not complaining. Instead, they're, they're, they're praying and they're singing. And not surprisingly, all the other prisoners are just listening. What is that? John Stott writes, instead of cursing men, they blessed God. Boy, that'd be a good practice for us. When things go wrong, when things don't seem to be going the way we think, instead of cursing men, they blessed God. Soon there's a violent earthquake, the prison doors open, their chains fall off, it's time to run for their lives, but they don't. Much to the jailer's surprise, right? He's ready to kill himself. Don't do it. Don't harm yourself. The jailer's cut to the heart. He, he must have heard Paul and Silas praying. He may have heard about what was going on in the city. He may have heard about the girl shouting out, you know, this, this guy's telling you about the Most High God. They're sent by the Most High God, telling you the way to be saved. He says, how must I be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. God used the most difficult places to bring life-giving opportunities. And he's still doing that. But, but we need to have our antenna, antenna up to engage the opportunities. He works in such mysterious ways. This was ugly. This was hard. This was painful. And God's building his church in that. God's redeeming and restoring and saving in that place. And there's places for us that are just painful and ugly and hard. And God's like, if you really look, there's work I want to do there. There's beauty I want to bring in that, out of that ugliness. So the jailer, like Lydia, opens her, his home. It's this beautiful picture. It seems like, you know, Luke, there's a lot of artistry in the writing. You know, this jailer is cleaning their wounds, and then right after that, the jailer and his family get baptized. So you get this, this picture of he's cleaning their wounds, and then he's, his wounds from sin are cleansed as he turns to Christ and gets baptized. And so God's salvation has come to Philippi. And, and God has begun to build his church in Philippi. And I'm going, to, I'm going to end here. That, that John Stott again points out that the male, of a Jew, the, the male head of a household in a Jewish household would have this prayer during this, this uh, time in history that he would pray every day. And sadly, it included giving thanks for a few things. It, he would give thanks that he was not born a Gentile. He would give thanks that he was not born a woman. And he would give thanks that he was not born a slave. Every day. Thank you, Lord, that I wasn't born a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. And you say, who did God start this church with? Those are probably the exact characters that God begins this church with. The core, the nucleus of the church in Philippi. Isn't that beautiful? It's the beauty of what Paul later writes in Galatians 3.28. There, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. So are we still ready for God to build this church in miraculous and mysterious and unexpected ways? With maybe unexpected people, who might that be for us? 
Are we willing to respond to the Spirit's leading, adjusting our plans, opening our spiritual eyes, and when the Lord tells us to open our physical mouths, to be part of the opportunities that he gives? So we're going to close our time this morning um, in his word with communion. So you have your little packets. <laughs> And I'm going to be very simple and direct here. I think that we're reminded in this story of the beauty that we're reminded, one of the things we're reminded of in communion, that God is still building his church. That God, that God is about rescuing people. So when the man from Macedonia pleads to Paul for help, God says, I sent you Jesus. God is, is saving people, one person at a time, building his church, those who would believe in the name of Jesus. And just like in Philippi, he's opening the hearts of businesswomen and, and corrections officer, officers and prisoners and janitors and doctors and teachers and students and farmers and full-time moms and construction workers and waiters and truck drivers and retired vets. He's opening the hearts of men and women and children, those who have had it maybe easier in life than some, those who have had it much harder in life than some. He's opening the hearts of Republicans and Democrats and independents and rich and poor, and the highly educated and the barely educated, and the formerly very religious and the formerly non-religious, and black and white and Asian and Latino, from every background and every experience, a motley crew of people that would have never chosen to come together on their own, but now are bound as one new spiritual family in blood, in the blood of Christ. And, and the story continues to this day, and even here and now it continues as, rem as we remember how this became to be. That the perfect God-man was willing to lay his life down for our sins. How must I be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. To make us what we are not. So that in him we may find forgiveness. Find reconciliation to God. Find new life, new identity, new purpose, new belonging in this new family. So if you take your, your bread, your wafer, for I received what the Lord, from the Lord, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Father God, we ask that in the name and authority of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you continue to build your church through us. Lord, may we look at Philippi as this wonderful, beautiful example, this, this local businesswoman, possibly this, this young girl who was a prisoner two times over, this jailer, this Roman Gentile, becomes the nucleus of your new people because Paul and Silas and Luke were willing to come in and share with them through meaningful conversation 
the love and good news of Jesus Christ. Help us to follow where you lead us, to, to halt when you say stop, to go where you say go. Help us to rise above, Lord God, the mediocrity and apathy that we too often accept as normal, to seek you with all our heart, to see each opportunity, even the tough stuff, as opportunities that you want to enter into and bring life. We pray this in the great, great name of Jesus.